explosion was this, has been described in a number of uh, different ways this afternoon, but all of them uh, horrific and very violent. And sort of like Pearl Harbor, black smoke all over. Also uh, descriptions of a mushroom cloud that came up out of it all after that. Uh, one gentleman told us that it actually blew the clothes off of several people who were standing uh, close by. It's massive. This is that building's history, I would say. Three individuals there have been burned over anywhere from 60 to 100 percent of their bodies. Telling us that he hasn't seen the likes of these injuries since his days in Vietnam, which certainly should put this into perspective for a lot of people. Uh, it's awful. It's awful. I mean, you know, everybody who works at Ford's extended member of the Ford family, and uh, I mean, I, this has got to be the worst day of my life. What went wrong? What happened? Who got hurt? Of course, those are the big questions right now. The one room where the blast happened, the boiler room, is at the center of all the attention. I'm Daniel Moran. I was a Ford Motor Company employee. I worked at the powerhouse since 1987. I started Ford Motor Company in, in the late 1970s. I was at the Ford Bruges power plant on February 1st, 1999. I was one of the boiler operators. I was the last operator to operate number six boiler before it exploded. And that's when all hell broke loose, right, as they were uh, taking it offline, which would be blanking it off or shutting it down, if you will. So all hell broke loose after that, and uh, this is my story. The day that the powerhouse did blow up, I'd already been an employee for about 20 years. Uh, that was a skilled trade position. My job was to... Uh, give relief to all the operators that were operating, all the boilers that were online, which means that they were, you know, active and running. When I came into work that day, I was told that I was going to be relief, and, and then when they set up a sheet saying what, you know, the agenda was for that day, they were going to shut the six boiler down because they used boilers for... Um, for, for need for power and how they use the power would be um, it's a generating plant, they use steam, compressed air, so when there's a demand depending on production or um, how cold it is out, um, then they put a boiler on and take it off, you know, at will when needed. Um, that particular day, six boiler was scheduled to be taken off. But in the morning, it was still running. So my task was, um, after everybody got their coffee and got to their stations, that I would, uh, in sequence, go to each, each boiler. Have been worked there for about 12 years. I was um, transferred there in the uh, late 1980s. Uh, the pl plant that I worked at, the steel division, was closed down. And, being skilled trade, they placed you um, where needed. And several of us that were in that area had transferred there. I've been familiar with these guys. We see these guys day in and day out. You get to be very good friends. You probably see them more than your family because of, uh, you know, eight hours, it gets kind of boring. You can only read the newspaper or, you know, attend to the job so much. So a lot of times you're... Uh, talking about family life or childhood or something like that. So um, most people, you knew them very, very well. So they were not only a co-worker, a union brother, if you will, but they were also a really close friend. And I think everybody there was, was pretty close. Even, you obviously, um, through personal in interest, through your age, um, or, you know, a lot of people were boaters, a lot of people were into sports. And when you're eight hours with somebody day after day, it, it, you really are their friend. You get to know everything about, you know their kids and they complain and they, you probably, they know you more than your family and vice versa. You know, they, you know, you're, you're pretty close. So that morning when I had uh, done the rounds and um, 
walked through the powerhouse, which I was very familiar with. I carried a backpack for personal books or something on my free time. So I walked to different stations and, you know, people had their coffee and newspapers. They were tending to their job. And uh, on that particular day, one of the fellows that was a close friend of mine, Warren Blow, and he had said they called him in early for, for this work and to shut down the boiler. And he was very tired. We were working a lot of overtime at that time because we had found out that Consumer Power was building a power plant you know, in construction, it was going to be like a year and a half. So we had a little more overtime than usual because they weren't going to replace retirees. And I remember the first time I heard it, um, I thought the guy was kidding. And I was like, oh, my God, I don't believe it. And like a lot of rumors, especially in a factory, um, they kind of do come true. A lot of times you hear some pretty odd rumors. And, it, and sometimes they come true, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad, obviously. You know, the day went on, I went to each station and familiarized myself. They knew who I was and, you know, they checked the boiler before they left. And, you know, and I believe it was um, three, five, seven, and six. And then we also have two and four, which were a, a one man operates two boilers because they're a lesser, lesser pressure than the high pressure boilers, if you will. They're both very dangerous and you know, high pressure boilers. I mean, it's just uncomprehendable to people who's not in the trade that the thousands of pounds pressure, I mean, if it developed a leak and you didn't know it, I mean, it could slice your hand off. I mean, it was very dangerous when you opened a valve, the packing could come undone. And I mean, it, and, and sometimes they did. So people were hurt, not quite regularly, but throughout the year, you would have several different uh, situations happen. I'd say, there's usually, you don't go a year or two without a fatality of some type, whether it be the steam tunnel or putting on a um, compressor or a turbine, which would run a pump to run water to the boiler. Um, a lot of times, you know, this is before, even though it's 1999, computers were just not in play. This building, it was built in 1925. The powerhouse in its day it was a well-oiled machine. When I got there, it ran, but it was, a, it was an old mess. We were using equipment that was probably outdated. So you checked everything out. That You took a reading once an hour. There was a phone at each boiler to, uh, in case you got a call or a demand for, for more steam or pressure or whatnot. And then they also on hand would have a, a work leader or, uh, and then also a supervisor, possibly two or three supervisors, and a general foreman that overlooked, you know, more or less everything that was going on. And on day shift, it was very, they kind of watched over you. Like, um, um, on the afternoons, the TVs came out, and the people that had an alcohol problem, you could tell they had an alcohol problem, there was a lot of substance abuse. There was a lot of people leaving the plant and, and, and just different things like that, that that for sure caused what happened. This is how Ford Motor Company ran their plant. I mean, from the time I started, I couldn't believe the lax safety rules. It, it was bizarre. I mean, at that time, I was 40, and there may have been out of 100, 100 plus operators in the powerhouse between the three shifts, I think I was absolutely one of the youngest. They were working on with a, a lesser crew and uh, giving them a lot of overtime, which uh, was mandatory, so you really weren't going to catch up on your sleep, and you were going to try to, um, you know, fit in your, your day, your family, and, and the different things. That day, um, after uh, giving the relief to uh, all the people in the morning, I went on to each boiler, and uh, it was pretty well just another normal day. There's usually donuts in the control room, which was the six control room actually shared a control room with the generators that generate the electricity from the uh, boiler. That was kind of a meeting place for different trades to come in, and I remember six boiler, um, when I started working there, they said, when you're going to have to make the coffee. And I'm like, 
I don't drink coffee. <laughs> it's just, well, you got to make it as part of your job. So they were too happy if you uh, didn't have coffee. You know, It was pretty well a normal day until about one o'clock. And well, then we all started with like, I believe a 15 minute break. And then later on a half hour break, which was your lunch. And I had just uh, went over to six boiler. Boiler was being shut down. And when you went to the lunch or we were operating the boiler, you had to speak with them and correspond with them so that they're bringing the pressure down, they're off the line, these are, these boilers are in sequence, so they, they run off each other. And once it was shut down, then the uh, then there was no longer for that six boiler to be running, obviously, they didn't need an operator after that, that the other guys would get more of a break. I remember um, the communication, and I found out later how, I believe, the explosion, how it was caused, but I didn't know it at that time. But uh, when a gas valve, gas valve was shut off at a control panel, um, that shuts the gas off. But you also have to use a manual valve and have it lot with a lock and change and whatnot. So having a shorter crew, and one thing I also want to stress, which I think is very, very important, is that uh, one of the uh, general foremen that was on days who had spent, I don't know, 30 years in one powerhouse and he really was very, very knowledgeable. He had just um, retired. Dave Antel, who was on afternoons, was knowledgeable, of course, but he did not, he was not used to the, the operation of possibly taking the boiler down. Um, like we did on day shift. You know, they may or may not have had that, I'm not sure. But I do know firsthand from working afternoons that uh, Dave Antel and his supervisors and the way he, he ran it and the way Midnight's ran their shift, it was very lax. Advisors were drunk, people were missing, they were sleeping. Wait, come up here, waking me up. Why are you waking me up? Why are you not call before you came back? It just was a free-for-all. It really, to be honest with you, it really seemed like it was just bizarre. When I first started, um, they said, well, you're going to work midnights. And I'm like, oh, okay. It goes, don't worry. You don't have to do anything. They sleep on midnights. Well, if you have high-pressure turbines running and steam equipment, how are you going to sleep? One guy would make a little round. And there were many times that there were some pretty expensive mistakes I noticed and uh, nobody was ever, you know, disciplined at all. The company was ran, it just seemed like the supervisors were happy, the plant managers were happy, the general foremans were happy, as long as there was a certain quota or a certain, in our case, you know, as long as it ran relatively efficient, which it kind of did, I suppose. And uh, there was a general maintenance that, you know, happened most of the time on days. But uh, um, just the day-to-day -day operation was just, uh, it, it just, you just couldn't believe, you know, you know, I'm going to go take a break, I'm going to go get high. You know, you would relieve people um, if they had a certain procedure during day shift, which was a little bit more regulated. An afternoon, if somebody had to go see their kid's baseball game or cheating on their wife, possibly, and they're going to meet somebody or go to the bar, that they would, uh, they would set it up where I'll tell you what, I'll let you go early, a couple hours, but uh, I'll do two hours, then you work for me for four hours. I mean, there were many times that uh, I would work two hours, I would be off, you know, on break for two hours. When I had had some of these breaks for a couple hours or sometimes for three, four hours at a time, I wasn't one to um, go outside the premises because I do remember one particular story. I mean, you pretty well could come and go if you want as long as the job was covered. But uh, uh, if, you got in a motor, if you got in a car accident or a motorcycle accident, I remember someone got in and one time fellow went to the casino and saved a woman's life and it was in the paper and you know that didn't look too good either. I know when I first started I didn't know any better. I was very green obviously at near in the early 20s and I just thought I believe it was Henry Ford II was in charge at that time and I just kept saying he's gonna walk in here with some 
peak security and he's just going to fire us. But as time went on, I realized there was never, ever going to be any kind of uh, discipline. You have to think to yourself, who's responsible? Who really, who, who could have came in there and said, hey, we just can't run a plant like this? And it just never happened. Morale was at an all-time low over um, the building of a powerhouse, knowing that there was going to be a large number of people out of a job. So, and the uncertainty to that and working a lot of overtime, I'm sure contributed to the deaths of, of the people that uh, were there and, and, and what happened. When I did get these extended breaks, being a uh, automotive history nut, you know, and, and being interested in, you know, how they ran their plant, I remember walking all over the complex, which I believe is a square mile, and the, all the different plants. And what always amazed me is that I was just waiting for somebody to say, what are you doing here? Why are you walking in this plant? I would walk all through the engine plant, the glass plant, the assembly plant. I'd be waving to different people. I'd go talk to them. It was very friendly. Just walking all around the complex by the water, watching the uh, freighters come in and have them unload. And sometimes you'd, they have a little patch of grass and you would sit there in the sun for a couple hours and just watch, you know, just enjoy your day while you're getting paid for it. And, and of course, you did have your responsibilities that you would come back and that job was covered. So, you know, you, know, you, you weren't in your eyes, you weren't doing anything wrong, maybe an efficient building, <laughs> it wouldn't happen. I'm not sure it happens anymore, but uh, that's, how, that's how it was ran. And uh, it gave me a really, really good history of um, you know, all the different buildings. A lot of the buildings were um, abandoned in place. Environmentally, they just had absolutely no safety procedure whatsoever. When they were changing a valve, um, there was like a like a chalky um, asbestos that they had on these valves probably for 10, 20, 30 years. Um, there was no, they would just tap it with a hammer. The asbestos would come out like snowflakes. And you know, another thing that was really amazing, which you probably can't even comprehend this today, is that nobody wore safety glasses. We, were all, we were all required to wear a helmet, which we did. But as far as safety glasses and respirators, um, being in the uh, Coke oven byproducts area, we had a lot of uh, naphthalene, benzoyl, all kinds of chemicals that are, you would probably need a spacesuit to try to shield yourself from this stuff. Benzene oil, which is very dangerous, we would clean our flashlights off with that. And when you were bored, you took some mercury and just played with it on the table. Uncomprehendable. The naphthalene in the air was like snowflakes also. I mean, you just, sometimes you cover your mouth, sometimes you just breathe it. Just did not have any really safety rules in place. You wanted to go change a, a gauge, you just shimmy your way out there. And we're talking several stories above uh, the ground. You could slip over. I, they didn't even have, you know, later on they had little harnesses and someone would tie you to the, you know, and sometimes you'd need a cherry picker or whatnot. But most of the time you just, especially, you know, you're on the afternoons or midnights and something goes bad, you just take your life into your own hands. When you were cooling down the gas from the Coke ovens, which was just large, you know, they'd pull these gas off with great, with big pumps and they would cool them, and uh, they, would, they would extract different things that they needed. They made tar and fertilizer and that they would sell. But the one thing I remember they, when they extracted this, this like ammonia acid that, they, that went through a coils to be cooled, which was part of our job when I first, the first eight years that was at Ford, we'd have the cooling coils were, were right from the Detroit River and we knew where the pump pulled it from, and 
we knew that um, you know that it went over and they went in into these you know actually it was, it was just like a um, a pipe that came down and it separated the waters into trays to go over the coils well when it got plugged up you know some fishy got pulled in and pumped through the line and we had to clean out a fish you know and um, which really shocked me is that you know when one of these coils would break from winter usually winter time and if you're sleeping or if you don't do your job properly like you're supposed to these le these leaks would um, would uh, go on for days and uh, that untreated water was just put back into the uh, Detroit River it wasn't until I think they shut down the coke ovens in 19 87, maybe a, maybe a year or two before that, they finally got water treatment plants. So let's just say for several years that I was there, and probably 50 years before then, they were putting this, this ammonia, you know, they were taking cooling water free from the river, and they weren't pumping chemicals in there by, you know, purpose, but these that water was used to cool coils and different things and when it did get mixed in together there wasn't a treatment plant and that even bothered me back then i didn't think that was right right before one o'clock on february 1st six boiler was supposed to be blanked off and shut down the fire had been off for quite a while the combustion chamber which heats the water that boils the water for the pressure um, it still lingers, it's still a hot firebox. The gas valve was shut off. There was basically very little pressure. And um, I was told from Pat Bozinski, the work leader, and Warren Blow, Pat said, you're done with six boilers, so go over and relieve the other guys. And uh, that's when pretty well all hell broke loose. So. Just a different story after that, for sure. And uh, I walked right in front of Six Boiler. There was like little catwalks. Walked down the aisleway, and uh, there was you know somebody working at seven, five because they were in sequence. And uh, I, at that time, I would have liked to talk to my family. So this was the age before cell phones, and there was a phone booth right there and I wanted to go use the phone or I could have went to two and four boiler which was right past them you know which I really would have used the phone and went to two and four that fellow was seriously hurt Dennis Arrington who saw me walking down the aisle was seriously hurt too but he saw me walking down the aisle he knew I was his relief he wanted to go possibly to the lunchroom or go somewhere I'm not sure so when he saw me, he just waved to me so that I knew that I was going to relieve uh, three boiler at that time, and which is right across from the um, from a little break room that has you know some vending machines and a refrigerator. I checked over the boiler to see that it was up to pressure. Everybody was in sequence, you know, so they pretty well knew if some there was a problem, which there wasn't, and. Uh, I went inside the explosion proof booth and that double pane glass and you know it was really only probably four by four feet I would imagine or five feet I'm not sure and a square and you have glass and you're overlooking the control panel which each boiler had and I just sat there and and the next thing you know I'm on the ground and I don't know why I'm on the ground and I hear screaming in the background, help me, and this and that. And it was black as night, and you could see fire off in every direction. And to this day, I don't know what could possibly be on fire. There's walls. <laughs> Does bricks burn? I'm not sure. But... Uh, after a few seconds, I'm sure, I opened that door, and that's when it hit me. There was no air at all. 
and it was just like a fish out of water. I just couldn't breathe. I know I was going to black out. I only had a few steps. I, there was really no direction to go. I went across the aisle way into the break room and I went from fires and screaming to just a break room, empty, with, with, with safety lighting being on. And I was weak to my knees. I, I couldn't take another couple steps. And to this day, I don't, it's not premeditated. I don't know how I would have thought of this. Maybe it was just natural instinct, but I stuck my head in the freezer and stayed there probably for about two, three minutes and felt that cold air. And that's what saved me. I'll never forget that. And uh, I had thought of something. I thought of a classic car. My dad worked for a competitor, so it wasn't a Ford. <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, I just, uh, you know, took a couple breaths and uh, I knew, you know, you don't know if there's going to be, you don't even know what happened. Other than the walls are on fire, you don't know if something blew up or, or what happened. So um, I took a deep breath after being there a couple of minutes. Um, I always think, wow, I didn't think of my mother, who was still alive at that time, or my wife, who I was married to and since gotten a divorce. But, you know, I didn't think of those people. I thought of this one car. But anyways, I took a couple deep breaths, and I went down that uh, stairway, which, you know, they, it's probably only the third floor, but it's probably really about six or seven, because you have to go down quite a few stairs. I held my breath through all of it, and uh, there was a little bit of opening, um, and that's where two employees, they were the first two employees that I saw, and uh, it was happened to be Dave Entel, who was the general foreman, and um, I was just happy to get outside and take a deep breath. It was like freezing rain, somewhere around 30 degrees that day, and uh, there was nobody out there yet. Dave says, we got to go back in there and close the gas valve. And that's when it occurred to me that, you know, I put the pieces together that, you know, that, that gas valve went into the combustion chamber and blew that boiler. And that's what was, you know, caused the explosion. And it was not going to shut off unless someone back, went back in there. Um, I did not have that information, so... Um, I may or may not have went by myself, I'm not sure, but Dave Entel and Larry Woodworth say, we're going back in. I said, okay, we're going back in. So we went back quite a ways into the fire, and, um, you know, it was a chain valve overhead, and we, we closed that valve that shut off the, ga the high-pressure um, natural gas going into the combustion chambers, you know, which you know, would have been a mess if we wouldn't have shut that off. And um, after that, um, I don't remember, but uh, Larry Wood went off on his own whatever he did. Dave Antel um, and I, we were going to walk um, to the front and uh, of the building, which, you know, we had to dart through the building and, and, and wasn't that far. I mean, we could run through it. I mean... Anything could happen, obviously, but when we got to the door, which was, I mean, you couldn't make this up, honest to goodness, um, he, we were going to open the door, and already there were some first responders, and that's where a group of people were, ambulance were already there, so there was some amount of time that went past, and he stopped at that door, he says, I'm not going out there, and he ran, honest to goodness, back into the fire. And I, I followed him and I grabbed him like in a John Wayne movie. <laughs> Believe me, I'm no hero. But I said, hey, you got to go out there. So um, I did kind of shake him a bit, you know, and he, he went out there. And uh, um, at that time, um, the first responders were somewhat of a distance away, kind of an open area. And um, 
There were some people congregating that were not hurt, that were scattered. But as, as we walked by, it was the front of the building, there were still people that were burnt coming out of the building. And uh, I'll tell you, it was a gruesome sight. It's, they had no clothes on. Uh, their hair was burnt off. They only had boots on. In some cases, their skin was melting off. They were already red, and because of the weather, there was steam coming off them. Being in that area, you could hear more screams. I can't blame the first responders for not going in. They didn't know how to navigate through that building. So, you know, I did go in there and direct, you know, with God's help, you know. Didn't, you know, and it was, oh. I mean, you didn't even know who you were helping because they didn't look familiar. They had... They were naked, and uh, they had no, some people had their mustache on, or it was, their mustache was not burnt. You know, just went in and, and just went to different areas that you could help people and direct them out, because they really did walk like zombies. They had a thousand mile stare, they couldn't talk. I did come across the only dead body on the site, which was Don Harper. There was nothing I could do for him. He was, you could tell he was dead. He, for some reason, had his um, coveralls still on. I don't know why. The last person that I helped out was Pat Polzinski. And um, he, um, I mean, he had no expression whatsoever also. By that time, an ambulance came and you know, and we helped him. In, you know, we helped him in there. He only had his boots on. Uh, do I love Pat Pusinski? Well, I'm not so sure. He he was kind of in the clique, and I really wasn't. So, but I did comfort him and say, Pat, I love you. You know, I know you're gonna be okay." At one o'clock, when um, they were taking the boiler down, I believe Warren Blow went there to close the valve. He had every intentions, obviously, of probably locking it out for what it, maybe he went to go get a chain. I'm not sure, but that was procedure to lock a valve so it couldn't be open. This particular valve, there was no way to tell that it was open or closed. There probably was a communication that um, he opened or closed it, and someone either came to and it's like, a, it's like a dial, it goes like a half a turn. It's not your traditional, you know, close a valve, open a valve. And I think somebody could have, he could have closed it. Someone went behind him and opened them. It's just like a half turn to really get that closed. It was not chained when the um, gas valve was, was opened on the um, control panel, letting all that high pressure natural gas into that hot firebox that still had a, um, you know, probably hot coal, you know, was still on fire more or less, even though the pressure was down. And that caused the explosion to just, you know, to, to you know, all that natural gas to just blow the boiler to smithereens. I mean, it just, you know, and like I said, if, if we didn't close that valve, it would have continued to um, keep, you know, keep that fire going. Obviously, it was a miscommunication that was fatal, and it was probably happened because um, morale was very, very low from, you know, we were going to close the plant for good. You just went to work knowing you could possibly not have a job, you know, within the next year or so consumer powers plant that was getting built in the parking lot that you that you parked your car in. It was across the street and you're seeing trucks come and go. We had went to, you know, a holding center and I was lucky enough, like before cell phones, to call my mother and uh, she was she was really happy and uh she had called my son who was in college at that time and uh he goes, oh, Dad, I knew you were all right. I'm like, okay. So um, 
that was really it. They, you know, busloaded us off to the union and uh, the union local 600 um, local, which is right about less than a mile away. And uh, um, we were told we could, obviously, we could go home. I didn't have my keys, you know, because my keys were still inside the building. So I had to wait for a ride, I know that. And um, so I did, and, uh, you know, I took the ride home, and when I looked in the mirror, I was as, I was black. I mean, I just, I mean, my whole face and every part of my skin from the soot, and, you know, it was before cell phones and taking pictures and selfies and whatnot, but... Uh, I washed up, and um, that night um, I couldn't sleep, you know, so I called another employee who was, um, happened to be off on medical that day, and, you know, he was a Vietnam veteran, so I said, meet me at my mother's house, and we could talk for a minute, and so that, I just pretty well stayed up all night, and and then in the morning, um, you know, I just felt really good about what the strength God gave me to do. And I just somehow, you know, I felt bad and I was thinking about my coworkers. But I also felt kind of good that, you know, I, I you know, you always wonder. You know, my father was a um, World War II veteran and he really downplayed it. And uh, And you have to understand, you know, I thought about that too. I'm like, you know, these veterans in Afghanistan, and, you know, i never seen combat, so, um, you know, they go through this day and day out. But like many veterans at that time that I'd talked to, you know, it doesn't happen when you're going to work and you stop at 7-Eleven and get, you know, I didn't drink coffee, so a Diet Coke and some cookies, and, you know, and you say hi to 25 of your workers and you're listening to your morning radio station and whatnot, so, you know, it was just a little different. I mean, my day, my life will never be the same after that. Um, I have to say, I've never once had a nightmare about it, but I'd have to say a couple times a month, I'm there to take a readings. You know, it's, there's, for whatever reason, I'm still there in the powerhouse at least Taking, like, I'm at work, it's, obviously it's always different. It doesn't look exactly like what you, you know, how it actually was in a dream. But it's never, like, it doesn't bother me. I don't wake up screaming. I just remember it. I just can't get that plant. You know, many things have happened before that and after that. But that just seems to have stuck out in my mind for, like I said, 20 years. I'm very proud of Ford Motor Company. Ford Motor Company is like America. I always reference to them that it's not perfect. America's not perfect. And I was proud to work at Ford Motor Company, trying to communicate with a few people that were there and see where the coworkers were being um, transported to, what hospitals. A few of them went to Ohio, and um, the ones that were in the area. Um, I went to see them probably, I don't know, five, six, seven hospitals. And I think that, you know, you know, you just can't make this stuff up because you would never expect this kind of response, you know. But um, when I went to the different hospitals, the, um, the families, sometimes a son or a wife, and sometimes different coworkers, but mostly the family, you know, you think they would be happy that you're alive. And they were upset and almost were mad at you because, I mean, I had one guy, like he wanted this, one of the sons of one of the um, people that eventually did die. Um, he was like, well, why aren't you in there? Why is my dad in there and you're not in there? And I didn't really expect that. I didn't, and I really felt like closing that valve off and... Um, you know, I'd have to say saving several people's lives to some degree, whether they would have made it out of that building or not, we'll never know. I mean, one for sure, he was pretty tangled up in there. And, uh, 
what I had seen and what I had done. I felt really proud of what I did and how, what, how it went, but uh, that was not the response I got. Even to date, people, that, friends I've known met since then and different people, nobody knows I was in the power explosion. I'd never bring it up to anybody. As crazy as it sounds, um, you have to understand that, you know, the, there was a generating plant and the powerhouse together. There were offices off to the distance. I'm sure a lot of people were affected. But where the blast was, you were either burnt. I was lucky enough to be in an explosion-proof booth. Those people were hurt seriously. Other people were possibly in a break room downstairs. What surprised me is that we just, there really wasn't much communication after that with, with, with other workers. The very next day I saw Dave Entel, who was the general foreman there, and I asked him, I said, Dave, you know, you know what we did and you know what I did. Can you put that down on paper? I thought if I saved his life, <laughs> I thought for sure, he would disregard the company and just put something on paper. He never did, which I lost respect for him. And then also uh, talking to people from the union, um, I told them what happened, different people what happened, I, and uh, I'll never forget the re first response that I got. I said, well, I did this, I did this, and they go. He looked at me and kind of, uh, he said, well, that's what you say you did. And I just didn't expect somebody to say that to me, you know. I thought they would say, well, great job, you know. But I never got a pat on the back in any way, um, which, you know, the best part was, obviously, I was not burnt. Um, I have always take that as number one, that I got to go home to my family. Um, my mother had passed away a year later, so, um, you know, I got to be with her. And, um, you know, it was, so that was, I really didn't expect anything else but that, but I didn't expect the reaction to how they felt about people that were in the powerhouse, at least myself. And uh, it was heartbreaking, it really was. It just got bad to worse because um, everybody that was in that powerhouse or in that surrounding area was more engulfed in what they did that day, whether they had the light shut off on them or something. And then I also got the response that, I mean, they just almost felt like you were guilty of some kind of negligence for the powerhouse to blow up. And then when I eventually uh, did go back to work, um, you were going into another place where they were filling you in and you were taking someone's overtime, so they either didn't want to, it was a little bit more bitter at that time, so they didn't want you to take their overtime or teach you the, da, the job. And um, as far as what you do during the explosion or I'm the one of the survivors, there was no um, you know, sympathy for you whatsoever. A lot of people that were in different areas of the powerhouse were not affected or were not hurt. Um, they all of a sudden could not go back to work and after talking to a couple of them they had said that Daniel you should go see the psychiatrist I'm not going back to work and I'm not capable of going back to work and I'm thinking well you were in the office over here I mean I know it's traumatic but and I talked to several people who just were not going to go back to work and there was from what I was told, a somewhat of a set price, you had to go to the psychiatrist, you know, and, but they, they said, well, you should go anyway. So I was like, okay. So I went to world headquarters and I sat down with a psychiatrist, a doctor, a woman, and she's like, well, how do you feel about this? And I feel good, you know, I mean, I feel like I did it, you know, with, with God's strength, I got through it. and. I'm looking forward to going back to work. She said, okay, fine. But it saddened me that several people um, took an advantage to say they weren't gonna go back to work. And this probably saddens me more than that, which I love my mom, I probably have a great mom, a great normal childhood. 
Um, and like I said, um, my both my grandfathers worked at Ford Motor Company. My father retired from Chrysler. My mother met my father at Chrysler. They worked at Chrysler. My sister worked at General Motors. So we're an automobile company like most people in the Detroit area. But my mother, when I got wind of this, when I had told, I says, these people are getting paid off. And my mother, and God bless my sister, I have one sibling who's a best friend of mine. We talk daily. And, uh, and my wife at that time, too. They were like, Daniel, you are crazy. You can't go back to work. And I'm like, you know, no, I'm not crazy. I'm going back to work. And, and I did go back to work. And, and I think I did it because, or I did it because it was in my heart to do it. But, you know, I just had a lot of hero figures um, from World War II and from the Korean War and even from Vietnam veterans, whether they were part of my my blood family, if you will, and uh, co-workers, and I didn't put it, you know, they did more, they did that daily. <laughs> they didn't get anything. So I really didn't expect some kind of big payoff. I really did kind of expect them to acknowledge that, you know, I helped, you know, and secure the building and I helped save some people's lives, but that never even happened. And, um, and one good example that comes to mind is that uh, Pat Bozinski, when I went to see him in the hospital, um, and I was really surprised that, you know, when, when you're burnt that bad, that um, it's almost like a goo, you know, like your, your face gets a lot larger. You almost look like some kind of, I don't know, like a flower, animal, or the blob or something. You really can't even distinguish it. It's a regular face because it, for a healing process, it must, uh, you know, just really come out like that. And it was horrible that we were, we were right in the room and, you know, he couldn't hear me, but, you know, I was talking to him. He remembered, I believe. Well, he did remember because I went back to see all these, or as many co-workers as I could. And um, Pat Bozinski, um, when he when he finally came out of, I guess they induced him into a coma, and and he was saying my name, and then um, um, I came back later after because I stayed in touch as much as I could, and uh, you know I went to the funerals too, and uh, you know it was you know it was it was it was sad, um, but Pat Blazinski when he eventually came out of the coma and. He looked good, but they did a good job on him. He looked better, and he was gonna. Um, he was getting married because he was engaged before then, and he was right there. And he says, "This is Danny." He says, uh, "You know, you're gonna be. We're gonna make a big deal. You at the wedding?" And the mother was there, and the sister was there. And I was like, "Wow, you know, that's very touching, you know." And felt a special bond with him. Well, guess what? Um, <laughs> Like most of the people who, you know, after that explosion, I never heard from them again. You know, they didn't have the same phone number and just really weren't in touch with anybody from that powerhouse that really was in the explosion, really. Um, and um, I eventually went on to several other, a few other plants before I retired and, uh, um, eventually, you know, I just didn't even mention it because it just wasn't even worth mentioning in anybody else's eyes. And, uh, you know, I retired as, as soon as I was eligible. I retired at a kind of relatively young age, you know, and that's what, what Ford Motor Company is a good company to work for. I did have some illnesses that, you know, could possibly have been related to my Working at Ford Motor Company, I guess we'll never really know why someone gets can cancer or certain things happen to them. But I've known people who were policemen or worked at a bakery that had certain illnesses. So I'm sure it didn't help, <laughs> but uh, um, I was just happy to, you know, have a good, healthy life overall. And whatever illnesses I did have, you know, I recovered and, you know, went back on my way. So... Just wanted to close this chapter, you know, what happened that cold, freezing rain 
day on February 1st. This is my office.